Greetings from the voice of Alan Kardec. And welcome from the voice of the spirits. We're here again today to take you on another small journey through the Spirits book by Alan Kardec. Today's journey will finish up good and evil, questions 638 to 646. And we will cover the divisions of natural law, questions 647 and 648. Enjoy. Enjoy. Question 638. It seems that evil sometimes results from necessity, such as, for example, the necessity in certain cases for destruction, even that of our fellow beings. In such cases, has there been a transgression of God's law? Evil is no less evil by being necessary, but this necessity disappears as the soul purifies itself in passing from one existence to another. Then people become guiltier when they commit evil because they have a better understanding of it. Question 639. The evil we commit frequently results from the position in which others have placed us. In such a case, who is more culpable? The responsibility for evil falls upon the one who has caused it. Thus, those who are led into evil by the position in which others have placed them are less culpable than those who have made them commit it. All will suffer the penalty not only for the evil they have done, but for the evil they have caused. Question 640. Are those who do not do evil themselves, but who take advantage of the evil committed by others, culpable to the same degree? It is as if they themselves had committed it. Upon taking advantage of it, they participate in it. Perhaps they would have recoiled before the deed itself, but once it was done and they took advantage of it, it was because they approved of it and would have committed it themselves if they could have or if they had been more daring. Question 641. Is the desire for evil as reprehensible as evil itself? That depends. There is virtue in willingly resisting the desire for evil if one desires to commit it especially when there is a possibility of satisfying the desire. However, if it is only because the opportunity did not present itself, the person is culpable. Question 642. In order to be pleasing to God and to ensure our future situation, is it enough simply not to do what is evil? No. All must do good to the best of their abilities, for all will answer for all the evil that has resulted from the good they left undone. Question 643. Are there persons who have no possibility of doing good because of their position? There are none who cannot do good. Only selfish persons never find an opportunity for doing so. It is enough to come in contact with others in order to do good, and everyday life offers such a possibility to whomever is not blinded by selfishness. Doing good does not only mean being charitable, but also being as useful as possible whenever your help is needed. Question 644. Aren't the surroundings in which certain people live the main reason for many to involve themselves in vice and crime? Yes, but even then it is the result of a trial chosen by their spirit in the state of freedom. It wanted to expose itself to temptation in order to have the merit of resisting it. Question 645. When individuals are immersed in an atmosphere of vice, 
doesn't evil become an almost irresistible draw? Draw, yes. Irresistible, no. Because in the midst of such an atmosphere of vice, you can nonetheless find great virtue. There are spirits who have the strength to resist and who have, at the same time, the mission of exerting a good influence on their fellow beings. Question 646. Does the merit of the good that one does depend on certain conditions? That is, are there different degrees of merit in doing good? The merit lies in its difficulty. There is no merit in doing good if there is no self-denial and if it costs nothing. God takes more notice of poor individuals who share their only piece of bread than of the rich who give only what is superfluous to them. Jesus told you this in the parable of the widow's might. Question 647. Is the entire law of God contained in Jesus' maxim of loving one's neighbor? This maxim certainly reaffirms all humankind's duties towards each other, but it is necessary to show them its application, because otherwise they will neglect such duties as they in fact do nowadays. Moreover, natural law covers all life's circumstances, and this particular maxim refers to only one of its aspects. People need precise rules. General and overly vague precepts leave too many doors open to interpretation. Question 648. What do you think of the division of natural law into ten parts? covering the laws of worship, labor, reproduction, preservation, destruction, society, progress, equality, liberty, and lastly, the law of justice, love, and charity. The division of God's law into ten parts comes from Moses and covers all the circumstances of life, which is the essential point. You may follow that division although like other classification systems, it does not contain anything absolute. Such systems always depend on the point of view from which a subject is considered. The last law is the most important, since through it humans can advance the farthest in the spiritual life. It sums up all the others. <laughs>